Good afternoon and welcome to the seminar of today, the Rabon seminar uh, in clim uh, about climate crisis and future generations. I'm glad to present Maria Grazia Portera, who is a researcher in aesthetics at uh, um, Università di Firenze. Uh, she's specialized in philosophy at the International School of Advanced Studies in Sciences and Culture in Modena and uh, uh, she is uh, a member of the editorial board of Aesthesis Journal. Her research are developed in two main lines, and uh, I would like just to uh, offer an idea about uh, this. Uh, on one hand, uh, she works uh, on the history of aesthetics, in particular between the 18th and 19th centuries in the German area, um, with the specific reference to the transition phase between uh, proto-romanticism and idealism, and uh, on the other hand, uh, on the interdisciplinary approaches to aesthetic issues in contemporary debate. In particular, Maria Grazia studies uh, evolutionary aesthetics, cognitive aesthetics, neuroaesthetics, uh, environmental aesthetics as issues uh, relevant for her investigation. Uh, she is developing her research by investigating the role of aesthetics in biodiversity uh, protection strategies uh, and uh, also about the question of the evolutionary origin of human aesthetics aptitude and uh, through the elaboration of a model of human aesthetic that uh, has the notion of habit uh, habitus uh, as uh, its uh, fulcrum. Uh, Mario Grazia is the scientific coordinator of the Cooperative University project, uh, uh, unveiling, assessing, and taking advantage of the aesthetic dimension in conservation practices. Butterflies as uh, a case study between new theoretical insights and practical applications. And uh, she is uh, uh, in cooperation with Dr. Uh, Daport of University of Florence, too. Um, uh, director of uh, another project uh, that is called uh, Smart Beauty, Theory and Practice of the Role of the Aesthetic Dimension in the Conservation Strategies and Advantaged Spaces. Um, I'm, uh, I'm glad to present uh, in, in very <laughs> few minutes some of the most recent publications of Maria Grazia. And uh, I would like to mention two volumes in particular. Uh, La bellezza è un'abitudine, come si sviluppa l'estetico, uh, Rome uh, 21, and uh, l'evoluzione della bellezza estetica, l'evoluzione della bellezza, sorry, estetica e biologia nel dibattito contemporaneo, uh, mi, uh, Milan uh, 15. Um, Maria Grazia, together with Professor Fabrizio Desideri, she also edited uh, um, the Italian collection of uh, the essays of Ellen Di Sanayake um, that uh, was entitled in Italian L'infanzia dell'estetica, l'origine evolutiva delle pratiche artistiche. So, uh, welcome to everyone to this seminar uh, that today uh, will be entitled Conservation of the Prettiest, the Role of Beauty and Other Aesthetic Categories in Biological Conservation Strategies. Um, please, Maria Grazia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. Thanks for inviting me. Very happy to be here and to be able to discuss with you some issues about my most recent projects on the role of aesthetics uh, in uh, biological conservation strategies. Uh, and as you will see, I will talk particularly on butterflies, which is my topic at the moment with these uh, colleagues uh, from the Department of Biology here at the University of Florence. As I was telling you, I'm not at the moment in Florence, rather I am in Giannutri, which is a beautiful small island in the Tuscany archipelago. Uh, this is this very small island, only 20 people live here during the year. And I am here because I'm participating in a field work with my colleagues from the Department of Biology on pollinators. And this is relevant from two different points of view, because butterflies are, of course, pollinators. Also, thematically, this is relevant for my project, but also methodologically, because um, um, in the last, uh, I don't know, over the last two years, I've been working quite a lot 
with these colleagues from the Department of Biology. And as a philosopher, I very much need these um, uh, occasions really to develop a common ground also conceptually with his uh, colleagues, because it's not so easy, and I will discuss a bit with you this issue, it's not so easy to find a common ground in order to uh, carry out common projects uh, also, uh, and even though we uh, start from the same starting point, we want to work together for biological, uh, for conservation of biodiversity. We very much have the same issues, the, the same aims, but it's not so easy. So I'm here because I am um, uh, participating into this project with them, and it's a very, very beautiful occasion to uh, share experiences, uh, uh, both practically, but also conceptually. Um, my, um, my point is, uh, um, as uh, uh, it is stated in the title of this presentation, the role of beauty in biological conservation strategies. What is the role of beauty? And as I will show you, the role of aesthetics in biological conservation strategies. Why it is important today in the very midst of an ecological crisis in a planet on fire that also uh, people from the humanities uh, uh, take action and cooperate with uh, people from the uh, environmental sciences in order to protect the environment. As you uh, already know, over the last, I don't know, 10 years, more or less, a new interdisciplinary matrix, so-called environmental humanities, has emerged, particularly in the UK, in Australia, and these uh, uh, interdisciplinary matrix put together a lot of different disciplines, such as the arts, literature, and uh, uh, okay, I, okay, aesthetics uh, and philosophy and uh, uh, linguistics uh, and a lot of other disciplines uh, under the assumption that it is important also for people from the humanities uh, to uh, participate in this effort to protect the environment. And why is it that? Why is it that? I'm quoting here a paper from Paul Olm in the 2015, published in 2015. And um, this quotation that you can read in this slide um, sounds, at the earth of global change in the 21st century, there are human choices and actions questions of human behavior, habits, motivations that are embedded in individual practices and actions, in institutional and cultural pathways and in political strategies. But if humanity, questions of human behavior, is indeed the force behind the changes on our planet, then the humanities are called to explore the new directions ahead of us. This is why we are really in such a condition that not only the people from the environmental sciences, uh, from the natural sciences, uh, are asked to try to understand why is it that, that our planet uh, is facing a, a global ecological crisis and try to find solutions for this crisis, but also has, as people from the humanities have said, because it's humanity that is indeed the force behind the changes on our planet. And so people from literature, from the arts, from philosophy, from history, environmental history, from sociology, all together trying to uh, carry out um, um, uh, projects, interdisciplinary project with the same aim, the uh, conservation of biodiversity, or in any case, uh, the idea of finding solutions for the climate crisis. Now, within this framework, what is in particular the role of aesthetics? As said in the introduction, I teach aesthetics, I teach history of aesthetics and contemporary aesthetics for students at the University of Florence. But, and my question is, of course, what is the role of my discipline, aesthetics? How can aesthetics contribute to, ad to address 
issues such as biodiversity loss, climate deterioration, and mass extinctions, for instance. Now, uh, over the last, uh, mm, I don't know, 20 years, uh, 30 years, uh, actually, there has been much work in aesthetics uh, on the boundary between aesthetics uh, as a philosophical discipline and, for instance, uh, evolutionary biology. Um, uh, Davide, uh, while introducing me, uh, was mentioning uh, uh, the work uh, I've been um, um, I've been doing in evolutionary aesthetics. So there has there, there have been a lot of um, studies and projects in empirical aesthetics, in evolutionary aesthetics, aesthetics of the landscape, environmental aesthetics. My point uh, with this project, uh, uh, with the colleagues from the Department of Biology in Florence, is try to um, uh, identify a new direction, a new research direction for aesthetics, which I would I, I would like to call something like aesthetics for the environment. So really trying to understand what is the role of the aesthetic categories such as beauty, but I, as I will show you, not just beauty, in this common effort to um, uh, defend uh, our planet for bio biological conservation and so on and so on, as I will show you, particularly discussing our case study um, about butterflies. Now, um, a starting point. Um, um, there is uh, properly nothing completely new in this idea of using human aesthetic preferences, for instance, for certain animal species, such as, for instance, mammals over insects or butterflies over beetles, because actually environmental organizations have used also in in the past, this kind of human aesthetic preferences in order to gain stronger public support for their campaigns. And I will show you a couple of examples, and I'm pretty sure that you are very much familiar with this example. Just consider that, I don't know, for instance, Greenpeace or other environmental organizations usually use as flag species of flag animals, uh, not beetles, uh, not insects in general, but for instance, pandas or polar bears or whales. And why is it that? Because they are cute, because they are beautiful in a sense. So um, I will try to convince you that aesthetics as a role for biological conservation strategies, but indeed, and in fact, environmental organizations have already started to use more or less um, explicitly or with more or less awareness this kind of human aesthetic preferences. So there is what we have called with my colleagues from the Department of Biology an aesthetic bias which is already at work and our aim as i will tell you is to try to um uh, put these bring to the fore this aesthetic bias and try to determine in a more uh, precise way the role of these human aesthetic preferences in biological conservation strategies but of course uh, um the assumption the basic assumption in uh, all these kind of project um, is, uh, uh, first of all, what do I mean with this term aesthetic? So uh, the title of my presentation is the role of beauty, which is an aesthetic category, um, the role of aesthetics in biological conservation strategies. But what is aesthetic? What do I mean, for instance, by aesthetic preferences? So a uh, starting point, let's start with uh, this kind of uh, very complicated star slide with a lot of concepts in it. Um, over the course of centuries uh, in the history of uh, uh, modern aesthetics, uh, uh, at least, uh, there have been a lot of concepts which have been used by philosophers in order to understand what is beauty as the most important aesthetic category and what is aesthetic experience. 
And this was also our starting point in this uh, common work with the biologists. Uh, philosophers uh, have uh, um, identified um, uh, the most important feature of beauty, for instance, uh, um, in symmetry, in order, in proportion, in complexity, in clarity, in pleasantness, in originality. So it's quite different. It's quite difficult to find a definition of beauty beauty as an aesthetic category or a definition of aesthetic experience because one of the first things that for instance my students learn when they attend my courses is that um, over the history of modern aesthetics uh, philosophers have just done one thing to put forward different definitions of the very basic categories uh, around which we work. So beauty, so sublime, so aesthetic experience. So there is a lot, a lot of confusion, I would say. So our first um, uh, aim with this uh, um, interdisciplinary project was to find a common ground, just to be uh, aware, just to um, um, try to understand what we were looking for, because our point was, try to understand what is the role of aesthetic, uh, aesthetic experience and beauty in biological conservation strategies. But of course, what is aesthetic? What do I mean when I talk about aesthetic experience? So uh, there is, of course, a model of aesthetic experience that I use uh, in these uh, in work. And uh, I will just uh, tell you a couple of things about that. Um, and these, these are the basic components, so to speak, of an aesthetic experience. So just imagine you are um, in the countryside, you uh, see a butterfly flying uh, just in front of you, you have what we have called an aesthetic experience. As I told you, our aim is to try to identify the role of this aesthetic experience in the motivation of people to take action in order to protect that kind of fauna at risk, a risk of extinction, in the specific case, butterflies. But what is uh, precisely this aesthetic experience that people have? And the uh, very basic components of an aesthetic experience are the uh, these um, four, at least, components that I'm just uh, um, identifying here. So every aesthetic experience uh, is, of course, a perceptual experience. Uh, um, uh, in every aesthetic experience, uh, there is uh, um, a role of what we know, cognition, and we will see, um, as I will tell you something more about the specific cases, so case study of butterflies, that cognition and knowledge as a very important role. Emotion, of course, emotions have an important role, but also imagination as a role. So our aim is to try, as told you, to uh, determine a model of aesthetic experience and then to try to understand what is the role of aesthetic experiences in the motivation of people, of visitors, or for instance, of natural parks to um, take action in order to protect those animals, those butterflies, which are at risk of extinction. Um, and uh, um, this is important to try to um, uh, understand what's going on when you have an aesthetic experience, because of course you have to start from something and agree on a basic understanding of an aesthetic experience in order to be able to uh, apply this aesthetic experience in uh, uh, the study of biological conservation strategies. And uh, um, again, another um, um, suggestion from uh, studies in, in empirical aesthetics, so here you can see uh, a model of aesthetic experience coming from uh, a quite uh, uh, important book published by um, neuroscientists uh, Anyan Chatterjee in 2014, I think. And this model has three different components. Uh, knowledge, again, every time you have an aesthetic experience, the role of what you, what you know is important and modulate the role of the other components, emotions and sensory motor experiences. So sensation, perception, the motor system. So um, knowledge, what you know, emotions, what you feel, 
and perception, sensory motor components of the aesthetic experience. Again, another example, uh, this is uh, um, another model coming from uh, um, El Mutlida. El Mutlida is the director of a lab at the University of Vienna. Um, they do wonderful work in empirical aesthetics, and these look like quite uh, a difficult uh, um, model to understand, but uh, uh, Again, here in this model, there are at least three components at work. This model try to um, explain uh, what does it mean to formulate an aesthetic judgment. For instance, I give you the example, the examples uh, which is important for me. Again, I'm in the countryside. I see a butterfly flying in front of me and explicitly or implicitly I formulate an aesthetic judgment. This butterfly is beautiful. What does it mean to formulate an aesthetic judgment? Again, of course, this model is applied um, on uh, works of art, but as I will tell you, uh, the, um, um, uh, so to speak, uh, the idea in our project with the colleagues from the Department of Biology is to apply the uh, fundamental uh, and also methodologically the fundamental concepts uh, and uh, uh, ideas of empirical aesthetics uh, on works of art to um, uh, dynamics, forms, uh, uh, and living beings such as butterflies. So what does it mean to formulate an aesthetic judgment such as, for instance, this butterfly is beautiful? There is, uh, as you can see, um, uh, links um, uh, on the left, sorry, not links, so it is German, left, uh, on the left of the, of the peak, um, there is uh, a perceptual component, uh, there is an emotional affective component, which modulate every phase, every steps uh, until the end of the experience, which is the formulation of the aesthetic judgment. So again, perception, emotion or affect, and what you know, knowledge, cognition, this kind of components uh, are integrated into the aesthetic experience and interact with each other so that, for instance, if you are an entomologist or a very um, a, a person very much expert in the field of butterflies conservation, of course, your kind of response to that stimulus, I'm using this word, but it's not a word that I like very much, uh, your response to that kind of stimulus, a butterfly, is different from the kind of response that, for instance, a people, um, a person without uh, so much knowledge or so much expertise in the field has. So our challenge is to try to uh, see um, what's the role of these three different components, at least perception, imagination, perception, knowledge, so cognition, and emotion in the aesthetic experience or of butterflies, trying to use models and um, ideas and concepts from the field of empirical aesthetics, which usually focus on the um, works of art. Uh, this is the title of uh, our research project in Florence, uh, and uh, David was already mentioning uh, these, um, the title of this project. The project, uh, um, the short name is Unveiling, Unveiling, Assessing and Taking Advantage of the Aesthetic Dimension in Conservation Practices. Butterflies as a case study between new theoretical insights and practical applications. And now I will tell I will tell you something more about why is it that, that we have started, we have decided to um, work on this particular aspect, the role of beauty and the role of aesthetic experience, emotions, cognition, uh, perception. Uh, for a biological conservation aims. Um, our uh, focus is our European butterflies. There are more or less 500 species of European butterflies, and many of them are on the verge of extinction. 
Um, you are probably familiar. I give you some preliminary data so that you can understand why is it important to focus on beauty and to try to quantify, so to speak, this role of beauty and aesthetic experience in biological conservation strategies. You are probably familiar with the um, directive of the European Commission, the so-called uh, habitat directive from 1992. Uh, this directive uh, um, on the conservation of natural habitats uh, and of wild fauna try to promote the maintenance of biodiversity. And within this council directive from 1992, uh, a series of red lists of animals on the verge of extinction, which should be protective, has been elaborated. And of course, also lists within the European uh, countries about butterflies on the verge of extinction, so that we should protect them. Now, um, my fellows uh, from the Department of Biology uh, already in the last, I don't know, 10 years have started to realize that this red list um, on butterflies, uh, this red list about butterflies, so all the butterflies that are included in this red list and so that are considered at the European level very much in need of being protected uh, present some kind of, um, I mean, uncertain points as far as their real need of being protected is concerned. And I will give you some example. In the red list at the European level, you find you can find a lot of uh, um, papillonidae. that you you know that all the european butterflies are divided into five big families papillonidae, pieridae licenidae esperidae and nymphalidae now um i give you an example um uh, in, in in the global group of european butterflies which are more or less 500 as i told you 15 are papillonidae but in the list of uh, butterflies which should be protected at european level um and are included in this red list the group is made of 21 uh, butterflies, six are papillonidae. This is an example. On the other hand, for instance, um, almost half of the uh, global group of European butterflies are nymphalidae, 20, uh, 247 um, nymphalidae out of 496, and eight of the um, um, protected butterflies out of 21 are nymphalidae. Um, so the families are not represented in the same way. And why is it that? Why is it that that um, uh, for two butterflies, which more or less undergo the, re the same risks of being extincted, one is included in the red list at the European level and the other one is not included because the one is not so beautiful and the other one is beautiful. Papiliospiton is a papillonide and is incredibly beautiful. Spialia terapne uh, is an esperide, it's not particularly beautiful and is very small and the color is completely different from the brilliant colors of the Papilio Hospiton. As I show you in this slide, both species have the same geographical distribution, both species undergo the same risks of going extinct, but Guess which one is included in the red list? Of course, Papilio, but not Pialia. And so um, since, I don't know, um, the beginning of, uh, over the last 10 years, more or less, my uh, co-partner in this project, Leonardo da Porto, uh, have started to realize it actually is one of the contributor in the elaboration
of these red lists, I started to realize that sometimes it's colleagues in this project of elaboration of the red lists um, uh, have taken decisions about what species introduce into the red list, which were not motivated by the real danger of being extincted but were motivated by other factors and he started to um, uh, ask himself is it possible that actually this motivating factor is beauty so the aesthetic attractiveness of these animals and you can see also in this slide Papillonidae and Papillonidae are incredibly beautiful are very much represented within the Direttiva but uh, the um, uh, number of Papillonidae uh, is just uh, 15 out of five and, uh, 496. So you, you can see the Directiva is completely different and organized in a completely different way, uh, which is not representative of the uh, real condition of the families within the global group of the European butterflies. So we started to um, discuss this issue. Uh, Leonardo, um, we had this possibility at the University of Florence to apply for uh, fundings, um, particularly um, uh, um, um, available, available particularly for young researchers, and more or less one year and a half. It was in two ten, it twenty. Yeah, it was two, two years ago. We wrote this project, and we started to discuss the best way to quantify this aesthetic bias. So uh, our idea is that this aesthetic bias, this role of beauty, is already at work. But actually, uh, biologists and natural scientists, in particular, people who are um, um, in charge of elaborating uh, strategies for biological conservation, are not aware of this bias. And that's why we have started to work on this project, uh, which is not uh, easy to be implemented. But uh, in any case, we, as I, as I will tell you, we um, have found uh, um, a way to try to quantify this aesthetic bias. Um, it's not easy. It's not easy to quantify uh, what we have called the aesthetic preference index. And why uh, did I show you in the first few slides uh, models of aesthetic experience? Because I wanted to make you aware of the fact that an aesthetic experience is made of multiple components. It's not just emotions. It's not just cognition or knowledge. It's not just perceptions. It's all these things together. And so to quantify such a complex trait is difficult. And from a statistical point of view, uh, Leonardo and me um, have designated, we have designated this aesthetic preference index as a latent variable obtained through the combination of a multivariate set of indirect and direct measurement of these possible response of human aesthetics to the attractivity toward non-human organisms, which in our case are butterflies. And we um, have uh, um, this as a model of uh, the um, uh, this is a model of the different component um, uh, of our aesthetic preference index uh, as a latent variable. So in this aesthetic preference index, uh, um, um, different things play a role. Of course, uh, the perceptual um, features of the butterfly, the emotional engagement of the observer, what the observer knows about the butterflies. So uh, I will tell you um, something about these uh, in the following slides. Uh, we have already some preliminary data about the different response of people with much expertise. 
um, which are exposed, uh, uh, who are exposed to an aesthetic stimulus as a butterfly. So there are different components of these aesthetic preference index. We are very much aware of the fact that it's not uh, easy to quantify it and uh, it cannot be a straightforward answer, so to speak. So our idea was, so our question was, how can we uh, work? How, what can be the best strategy in order to quantify this uh, aesthetic index? And it's important to quantify this aesthetic index also from the perspective of conservation biology. Um, and this is a very important point, for instance, to Leonardo, because uh, you know that uh, there are many traits uh, which are available for European butterflies, but for animals to be protected also in general. Um, and usually these traits, which are considered in order to track the conditions of the populations of, for instance, European butterflies, usually these traits, the functional traits are intrinsic traits of the animals, such as, for instance, their size, their host plants, their phenology, their behavior, or also variables referring to their habitat preferences. And these traits are usually used to predict the decline of a species of butterflies, for instance, under certain environmental changes. But our aesthetic index is something different because it introduces a new dimension in butterfly conservation, which is a relational dimension. Uh, the aesthetic index is important because it's like uh, a new trait to be considered in biological conservation strategies, and it's a relational trait. You know, aesthetic experience is, of course, a relational experience. You are in front of a work of art or in front of a butterfly in our case, and um, it's a subject object interaction is a relational trait for essence, um, uh, the aesthetic, uh, the aesthetic experience. And our idea is to introduce these new relational trait, which should be in our um, in our ideas should be really a kind of revolutionary new trait uh, in uh, biological, uh, in, in conservation biology, not just an intrinsic trait, but a relational one. Now, how it works, how um, we have decided to um, uh, implement our um, project in order to be able to quantify these multi-component aesthetic index, um, um, which is so important as it seems to be actually in conservation biology um, strategies for butterflies. And um, um, there are two directions which we are following right now. Uh, direct measurement of these aesthetic index or aesthetic bias or um, aesthetic experience of butterflies and an indirect measurement. So our methodology is a twofold direct measurement and indirect measurement. Direct measurement. Um, uh, over the last four or five months, we have been working quite intensively on a website. Um, this is the name of the website, um, which will be released uh, uh, next week, actually. So I'm very happy to be able here to show you in preview uh, some of the pages of our website. And this website will be a dedicated website where the users, users will be asked to assess their aesthetic experience of butterflies in all the components which I uh, will um, present to you in the uh, preceding slides. So an emotional component, a cognitive component, the component of knowledge, a perceptual component, because this is really an important point. It's not just a question of I prefer um, butterfly with uh, a symmetric shape of the wings uh, over another one which is not so symmetric because beauty is not symmetry and that's all. Beauty, as I told you, or aesthetic experience, as I told you, 
it's really a multi-component uh, um, uh, experience. It's really a multi-component trait, um, which um, should be considered in all its complexity, because um, uh, this is really for us an important point, uh, perception, emotions, the knowledge should be considered uh, uh, globally, and particularly, uh, we want to understand in which ways the three uh, basic components interact with each other in order to be able, at the end, implicitly or explicitly, to formulate the study judgment. This butterfly um, is beautiful, and of course, to quantify the role of this uh, aesthetic judgment in the uh, motivation to protect or defend the animal. That we show you here um, uh, in preview our website. Uh, this is uh, the, on our own page. Uh, and uh, um, these are the different components that we will try to put to test. Uh, um, these are, um, yeah, this is the section of the website and the test, online test within the website, um, which collect the, which collects the anagraphics, so the data about name, occupations, the background, education, and so on and so on. This is uh, um, a section of the online test about the attractiveness of the butterflies uh, in which the user is asked to um, um, order to uh, um, uh, uh, try to uh, put in order the butterflies uh, um, according to um, uh, the, their attractiveness. Uh, so you will have uh, this um, um, page with uh, nine different uh, uh, pictures of butterflies uh, and uh, it's a kind of ranking uh, task that I will ask we will ask the user to um, carry out this is the perceptual the section about perceptions perceptions so the um, um, the user the user is pretended is presented with 10 different couples of images of butterflies and in each image um, a perceptual feature so a feature in the butterfly which is perceptually relevant such as for instance the presence of absence of eye spots is evaluated and assessed and uh, this is the section as told you about perception of course there is a section about the emotional engagement so we will present the user with uh, a series of images and we will ask the user User to identify the kind of emotional response in front of which is triggered uh, by this image. And uh, it was not easy to identify um, a series of basic emotions. Um, at the end, we decided to um, uh, use this series of emotions there is one change that we have made so vitality is no more there but anyway it's a profonda meraviglia it's oh the same kind of emotions that you uh, have uh, in, uh, when you are exposed to sublime to the sublime disgust joy interest curiosity and fear so as i told you perception as a component emotions as a component and of course uh, uh, interest and knowledge what you know already about butterflies so we want to consider all these basic components and then to try to understand understand um, what is the attractiveness of uh, the different butterflies uh, uh, and quantify as a relational trait this role of uh, the aesthetic attractiveness um, as a motivator and a driving force. Because as I told you, this driving force is already at work, but uh, uh, people are not aware of it. And this is the uh, direct measurement part. The indirect measurement part uh, is based on the analysis of an incredibly um, vast, big data set of pictures of butterflies taken from a citizen science platform, which probably you are already familiar with, which is iNaturalist. So what's the point with iNaturalist? 
um, just imagine that you go and visit the Parco of Arcipelago Toscano, uh, where I'm here at the moment, you are in the countryside, you see a butterfly, you have already downloaded iNaturalist app on your phone, you take a picture of the butterfly and you upload the picture on the iNaturalist platform. By why have you decided to take that picture of that particular animal, of that particular uh, butterfly? So our uh, idea is that actually people are of course more motivated to take picture of butterflies and upload them on iNaturalist when butterflies are when butterflies are particularly attractive. So it can be, and Leonardo is a very, very um, intense and active contributor of iNaturalist, my, my co-partner in this project. Our question is, is it possible that pictures of particularly attractive species are uploaded with unexpected eye frequencies in iNaturalist. This is, of course, an indirect way of measuring the impact of the aesthetic attractiveness. The website is the direct way of measuring these attractive um, uh, uh, bias or these by bi these aesthetic bias or this idea of the aesthetic attractiveness. Um, what can be the applications of uh, this project once we have quantified the role of the aesthetic bias? Uh, first application. Um, this is the main question. Is it possible that the species included in conservation lists, such as, for instance, the red list IUCN at the European level, are selected among those with a higher study index? As I was telling you, between two butterflies with the same risk of going extinct, one is in the list, the other one is not in the list. Why? because the first one is more beautiful than the other one. Or, second question, is it possible that species included in the most popular guides to identifying species of butterflies are selected among those with a higher aesthetic index? Or, is it possible that the species that possess a common name, a popular name, not the scientific one, but the common way, name, are selected among those with a higher aesthetic index. So our idea is actually that beauty and the aesthetic attractiveness as a role, as a role um, under many respects, but this role and these um, influence of the aesthetic uh, um, experience, the beauty and the aesthetic bias should be quantified actually. And um, um, there are other two possible applications um, that uh, we would like to consider. Um, butterflies, butterfly species with a high aesthetic index can be, for instance, used as flag species. You know, flag species are iconic animal species which are able to capture the public attention and raise awareness as flag species of local diversity to advertise the public and the institution about the importance of established conservation actions, but also species with a high aesthetic index, index can be used as umbrella species, and an umbrella species is a species whose protection confer protection to a wider array of co-occurring species in order to facilitate conservation of the entire local communities. So there are a lot of different applications of this project which we are um, uh, working on. Once we have been able to quantify, in a sense, to identify first, to assess, to identify, assess, and then to quantify this aesthetic bias. And um, I would like to show you a couple of preliminary data. Leonardo and his team has done some research, uh, collecting some data in the past two months, more or less, and we are writing right now 
a paper on this first two uh, first preliminary data on the attractiveness of butterflies and the role of these aesthetic attractiveness focusing in particularly in particular on the dimension so taking dimension um the how big a butterfly is uh, as a component of its aesthetic attractiveness so the assumption is that the bigger the, the butterfly are the more likely is that they um, are uh, perceived as attractive by um, observers for instance by the visitors in a natural park and here i will show you three different graphs uh, let's start with the first one. On the X axis, you can see the flight direction. Um, and on the Y axis, you can find the um, number of observations. Blue line uh, and red line measure the so-called observer effort. Blue line, much committed observers red line not so much committed observers so it seems it seems this is the first preliminary data that a longer flight duration has an influence on the number of observations in the case of very committed observers so very committed observers take many more peaks of butterflies and the more the butterfly is available in nature uh, from a temporal point of view, the more likely is that very committed users, very committed observers, take a picture of these butterflies. Second graph uh, focused on the Chikapa map 2, which is a checklist uh, focused on the geographical distribution of butterflies, in particularly in Italy. It seems that the more widespread geographically the butterflies are, the more likely is that very committed observers take a pick of them. And these two results are quite obvious, are nothing particularly um, uh, interesting. No, it's interesting, but anyway, it's not so unexpected that things go in this direction, in this way. The third graph, graph is particularly interesting because um, it, measure, it measures the wingspan. So how big butterflies are. It seems that from this preliminary data that the bigger the butterflies are, the more likely is that people not so committed take a pick of them. And when I uh, talk about not committed observers, I refer to the observers which are not so active in uploading pictures of the animals because, for instance, they do not visit so frequently natural parks. So it seems that people that go not so frequently, that do not so frequently take pictures of butterflies, are more attracted by bigger butterflies. Um, butterflies which uh, uh, result more attractive and of course being big um, have a bigger wingspan is a feature of the aesthetic attractiveness but people who take a lot of pictures of butterflies in the sense that they are very committed observers are usually more attracted by smaller butterflies and this can be it's really really uh, a set of preliminary data this can be like a cue like um, a suggestion in the sense of the role of expertise in modulating the attractiveness and the aesthetic attractiveness in experts, in people who are committed observers. I'm very much aware of the fact that these data are very, very much preliminary data. But as I told you, our idea is that emotions perceptions and of course wingspan is a perceptual, perceptual feature and cognition interact in the aesthetic experience uh, and modulate differently the aesthetic experience according to for instance the different level of expertise 
of a service. And this data uh, seems to go in uh, this direction. So um, our idea, um, thanks to the website, thanks to the online tax test, uh, thanks to the indirect measurements, uh, is that in the end, experts and non-experts have two different uh, types of study response to butterflies. Um, of course, uh, uh, I've been talking so far um, about beautiful butterflies, but what which you do with the ugly ones? Uh, because of course, uh, it's um, of course a good idea to use beauty in order to motivate people but uh, uh, also the ugly butterflies or butterflies which are not attractive or not so much attractive to us should be protected in many cases. The um, uh, second or the last part of our project, um, we are also considering uh, um, uh, the idea of applying for further funds uh, in order to funding this uh, uh, last section of our project, is try to um, identify and uh, um, uh, implement uh, um, strategies in order to um, uh, uh, teach people or to give people, experts and not so committed people, the chance of remodulating their aesthetic experience. Um, because, uh, of course, uh, um, uh, you can be attracted towards a uh, um, butterfly with uh, certain features uh, according to your level of expertise or your emotional engagement, but it's important to um, uh, educate, so to speak, people in order to uh, develop all also um, different types of response to uh, these uh, um, living beings and to these uh, animals. So the uh, uh, this last part of our idea of our project is usually to um, uh, try to build um, strategies um, and uh, uh, actions uh, in order to build what we have called aesthetic communities of conservation, communities in which uh, um, certain aesthetic tastes, so to speak, can be shared and um, people have the chance of remodulate gradually or being educated, so to speak, to explore uh, the different uh, uh, tastes and the different ways in which uh, animals such as these butterflies can be attractive to our eyes. So um, just to uh, recap, um, First of all, um, what is an aesthetic experience and try to uh, take into account all the different components of an aesthetic experience, which is a, a very complex and multifactorial experience. Um, methodologically, an indirect way and a direct way to measure what we have called a study bias applications of this uh, uh, study of the aesthetic bias uh, and I uh, have show, shown you the different applications, possible applications of this uh, study uh, and uh, ideas for remodulating or for giving people the possibility of reconceiving, rebuilding, remodulating their aesthetic experience of butterflies in order to um, 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 to uh, make these aesthetic attractiveness uh, more and more effective in the frame of uh, uh, global biological conservation strategies applied to um, uh, butterflies. Uh, these are what we are working on right Right now, um, since I told you that next week our online test and website will be released, I very much hope that you will uh, um, uh, uh, go and visit our website www.unveiling.eu 
and in particular you will do our online test uh, because we want to collect really really many data in order to be able to have good results um, with our project and um, this is a uh, um, uh, final quote uh, um, uh, very much like me and Leonardo very much, much like this work this quote and you are already familiar I think with this quote and this is so to speak the cornerstone of uh, our whole project every this is Aristotle every realm of nature is marvelous uh, um, uh, uh, and as Heraclitus when the strangers who came to visit him found him warming himself at the furnace in the kitchen and hesitated to go in reported to have bidden them not to be afraid to enter as even in the kitchen divinities were present so we should venture on the study of every kind of animal without distaste for each and all we reveal to us something natural and something beautiful this is actually our idea beautiful is a driving force we are attracted and we feel this aesthetic attractiveness towards certain um, uh, species of butterflies we want to quantify this aesthetic attractiveness index but we also want to um, uh, bring to the fore the fact that uh, uh, this is just the first step um, really Aristotle um, uh, we very much agree with Aristotle of course every realm every species of butterflies is marvelous uh, for each and all we really reveal to us something natural and something beautiful and uh, really beauty in the sense uh, as um, 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 a pivotal and crucial role in the conservation of biodiversity. Um, this is our work uh, so far, and um, I would like to um, have uh, questions from you uh, because I think that this chance is a um, uh, valuable chance to um, um, just discuss uh, our methodology and research strategies, uh, particularly because we are um, uh, we will release the website uh, next week, and so to discuss uh, our ideas with you this afternoon would be for me really um, important, and um, I um, I'm grateful in advance for any questions we will you would like to ask me about uh, our unveiling project okay i think i will stop here thank you thank you maria grazia for your inspiring and real interesting talk <laughs> it's really a great opportunity to us uh, to investigate the connection between uh, two uh, dimensions let us say one is the empirical uh, one and the other the theoretical one, also the connection between aesthetics and biology. So this is very a great occasion. Uh, the QA time is now started and uh, I remind you that uh, for question you can write in the chat box uh, or uh, raise your hand using the button uh, available in the WebEx. So uh, th there is a question from Elena Casetta, the first one, please. Yes, thank you very much, Maria Grazia. And I, I apologize. I uh, I asked you to make the first question because I uh, after I have to go. But that was very really interesting, and uh, yeah, I wanted to know more about the, the project. Uh, and now I know. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, actually, I take my chance if I can, Davide, to ask two questions. So one is more specific, and the other one is more general. Um, the specific one is the following: When when you uh, suspected, so to so to say, that there is an aesthetic bias in the habitat directive in the butterflies listed in the habitat directive, um, that I don't know. But uh, do you know which are the criteria that uh, are used uh, to include uh, butterflies uh, in the habitat directive? Because I don't know that. Mm -hmm. uh, but for instance, I don't know in the IUCN red list. Uh, uh, they recognize uh, they have criteria and then they recognize, for instance, that there is uh, a vertebrate bias uh, so that uh, vertebrates are more included and more known and more described uh, rather than other species, etc., etc. And they try to take that into account. 
So I wanted to know which are the, uh, the criteria to include the butterflies in, in the directive. And the more general question is, um, is the following. Uh, in promoting a sort of, uh, let's say, aesthetic, aesthetic approach, okay, um, it seems to me that it is a, a wide, a, a, a wide uh, a view of aesthetics in the sense that it also includes knowledge. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I was, but my question is, uh, do you think that uh, uh, the knowledge aspect, so to, uh, so to speak, um, is uh, enough to guarantee that the functional aspect is included? I mean, um, we don't want to conserve biodiversity just because it is beauty. We want to conserve those species that are functional for the ecosystem. Otherwise, the, the ecosystems do not work anymore, right? And of course, the health of the ecosystems does not depend on the beauty of animals, right? Or, or of the beauty of species, right? So uh, that is my main, uh, I think, uh, um, let's say worry towards an aesthetic approach, mm -hmm. um, which is also one of the criticisms that are usually moved to uh, the focus on uh, charismatic species or flag species, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. So I, um, uh, as for the, uh, habitat directive. So actually in the habitat directive, the most important criteria are the, um, uh, health conditions of the population. So, um, uh, um, um, which kind of risks of extinction these species of butterfly undergo. There are different version, versions of this red list. So the ICNU list and also the updated version of the list consider many more uh, criteria, but really in the Habitat Directive, I was talking about these just uh, last night, actually. Um, uh, there is this uh, idea of putting in the list uh, butterflies uh, in particular because of the um, uh, attachment of uh, uh, people to these species of butterflies, uh, their um, the attractiveness, the role that they have also in campaigns for protections of butterflies, for instance, Esperidi, um, are not represented in the Habitat Directive list, although they represent an important part of all the group of European butterflies. And uh, the risk of extinctions for many species included in the Asperidae family is more or less the same for other species of Papillonidae, um, which are just 15 out of 500. So it seems that really in those lists, uh, there is something that is at work and uh, the uh, um, uh, researchers elaborating this list are aware in the sense uh, that they perhaps feel more attracted to towards this kind of species, but uh, in many cases are not so aware of the kind of biases that they have in uh, uh, setting up this kind of lists. But the main criteria are the um, health conditions of the population, so health condition of the population of species and the uh, extinction, the risk of extinctions. Um, so these are, of course, there are many uh, versions of these uh, lists, but I would say that the geographical distribution, the health condition of the populations uh, and this risk of extinctions are the uh, main criteria of the um yeah. uh, uh of the habitat directive list um as for the aesthetic approach um yes i know of course uh, um uh, on the one hand uh, so th it's there are these two things are very much different i mean on the one hand the functional aspect of ecological systems uh, and on the other hand the how, how beautiful butterflies are so our idea is to try to use 
beauty as a kind of driving force or motivating force. And this is why we would like to use beautiful butterflies or an idea for possible applications is to use um, beautiful species as umbrella species in order to be able to protect these species and uh, by protecting them, also protect those species which are not uh, um, uh, immediately attractive, but are useful in the sense of the, that functional aim, which is the um, uh, functionality from the point of view of ecological systems. I know that this is, of course, uh, the main questions. Uh, um, this is the main question. We want to put, protect biodiversity because we want ecological systems to um, function well. Uh, also from the point of view of the kind of resources uh, that uh, we as human beings want to uh, continue to have from the uh, systems and ecological systems within which we are embedded. But the idea of using as flag spe as umbrella species beautiful butterflies uh, can be um, an, a useful point of view or a useful perspective in order to protect also those are the species which are functional, useful, but are not immediately attractive. So I think that really beauty can be a driving force, um, can be a motivating force. It is already, but we are not aware of that. And um, biases can be um, regulated or even corrected, but it's not just a question of we should identify the bias so that we can correct the bias. It's a question of we can benefit from this motivating force of beauty in order to protect by means of the beautiful species, also those species which are not immediately beautiful but are useful from a functional point of view. I don't know if I answered your question yeah yeah thank you yeah yeah uh, absolutely but why not if there are other questions david no at the moment uh, you are the only Sorry, one i can ask a short one again yeah okay uh, yeah but why not uh, to um yeah you'd say using the bias uh to like i mean sort of uh, panda butterfly right mm -hmm. okay yeah okay uh, but why not to measure the bias if there is a bias uh, to uh, so the aesthetic index? Uh, why not to use it to to see whether we can change the we can somehow educate the aesthetic the aesthetic judgment in order to mm -hmm. um, having also the ugly species to be uh, liked by people. Okay. okay. I don't know. I'm okay. a fan of, of ugly species. So. Yeah, of course, of course, because um, 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 an aesthetic experience is made, as I told you, of different components. There are components on which we can work on, actually, but there are other components which are very much related to how our cognitive um, uh, system works, actually. So we are attractive uh, um, um, towards uh, symmetrical uh, shapes, for shape, for instance. And this is something that it depends on the way in which uh, our cognitive system works. So I can educate people until a certain point to feel, how can I educate people to uh, be more attractive towards uh, certain kind of shapes instead of other ones? Because uh, I can introduce new components into their aesthetic experience, such as, for instance, experts um, um, are not satisfied with uh, um, all these symmetrical shapes. Uh, so there is a, a, other data showing us that there is uh, um, um, usually experts or people uh, which are very much familiar with entomology, for instance, do not feel in such an intense way this kind of attraction towards symmetrical forms. But not uh, um, uh, to which to, to what extent actually not uh, um, until the point that uh, 
can, they can um, uh, find uh, completely unattractive symmetrical shapes. So it depends on the um, extent to which you can remodulate the aesthetic experience. And I would not say that the aesthetic experience is something innate, which is not. It's not something that depends on the activation of, I don't know, certain brain regions or certain psychological modules, because this is not. But I also would not say that the aesthetic experience is something that we can completely rebuild because it's a multifactorial experience with, I would say, more universal components, basic components, such as, for instance, our attraction towards um, uh, uh, contrast or towards symmetrical shapes or, um, I don't know, other things like uh, regularity of order, um, which are more universal or um, more basic and more widespread that, for instance, uh, the uh, attractions towards uh, the um, not so frequent species of butterflies that I very much like because I'm an expert in entomology. And then I remodulated my first response to that kind of uh, um, stimulus. So I would say that what you suggest, why not to rebuild the aesthetic experience of people so that they can find the ugly species beautiful? is a direction and of course is a direction that we take into account uh, with these educational uh, uh, applications of our project but i would say it's not it cannot be the um, um, final solution or the final answer so to speak and it depends this depends on the complexity of the aesthetic experience which i would say as i told you is um, 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 uh, it's a core it has a core which is uh, more universal and has to do with perceptual features of the stimulus. And these perceptual features can be remodulated, but uh, not completely um, by what you know and what you feel. So cognition, emotion, and perception. That's why I would not say that remodulating can be the final solution for this specific kind of answer. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. There is a, there is a question from Matteo in the chat box who write, and I can read, uh, I think the project is useful from a representative political point of view, as it helps uh, to define which representations of butterflies are most appealing to the general public and to encourage approval of their protection at, at the same time. Are we sure that beauty is a property emerging from a photographic representation or perhaps on the contrary, aesthetic appreciation is only possible in the actual life experience uh, uh, of meeting and relating to the butterfly? This is the first one of the of the question. Please, Maria Grazia, if you want to answer for, uh, yeah, yeah, about yeah. this, and yeah, then yeah. I can read the other one. Of course, this is one of the points of the project. Of course, uh, this is really an important point because um, um, uh, what kind of pictures are we considering in order to uh, put to test uh, these aesthetic bias, uh, to quantify this aesthetic bias? We are taking into account pictures um, uploaded from visitors in natural parks. Um, so not, so to speak, uh, uh, sophisticated pictures. And this is, of course, because we are very much aware that there are, these are two different things. On the one hand, uh, to present uh, people with sophisticated photographs taken, for instance, by, I don't know, experts photographers um, um, or natural experts in naturalistic photography. Um, and uh, a different thing is uh, to um, assess and to quantify, I would not say to quantify, to uh, reflect on the aesthetic experience of people in the park with the living being in front of them are two completely different things. But in any case, it's uh, a kind of, um, um, I mean, 50-50 uh, solution that we have uh, find out. Taking the pictures uploaded by visitors, so very, very normal people, or um, 
over there in the parks and uh, look at the butterfly, find it uh, attractive or in any case interesting, want to take a picture of that of uh, this butterfly and upload the picture in iNaturalist. And this is like of a compromise that we have found out. But I very much agree with the fact that uh, um, uh, the lived experience, uh, the aesthetic experience of butterfly in uh, uh, a park is different from the experience of the butterfly mediated by uh, its representation but uh, in the sense that this representation is not um uh, artistic representation um it can be that in any case something of the lived experience is retained but i'm very much aware that this is a point this is a point in our in our project i very i'm, I'm very much aware of the fact that uh, um um uh, the um um uh, ecological dimension of the experience uh, uh, is important and um, uh, I've been working a bit uh, in the past few years uh, in empirical aesthetics uh, and one of the main issues in empirical aesthetics uh, is the, the kind of, of experience that you have of a work of art uh, when you for instance uh, uh, undergoes, uh, undergo an fMRI and you are are in the fMRI machine with a representation 10 centimeters for centimeters of the work of art and something completely different is when you are in a museum and you are in the museum uh, in an ecological condition of aesthetic experience of the work of art in front of you so there are two completely different things but in this sense um if we if you think that we uh, consider and use photographs taken as you as you write as a result of a lived experience perhaps this aspect um can be integrated as you as you write and that's why we decided not to use uh, photographs taken by photographers uh, with uh, an experience in naturalistic photography and we decided to use only photographs and pictures taken from the database uh, in nine naturalist it's a compromise uh, i'm very much aware of that but it's the best way we have uh, uh, found uh, in order to uh, address this uh, issue which is an important one and i thank you for the question So I think you you answer also to the second and third yeah, yeah, because yeah. there is uh, also your explanation concerning the the development of the project. I don't know if there are um, someone who would like to ask something. For me? Yeah, of course, please. Thank you very much for your paper for your interesting paper. My my question is uh, more or less on the foundation of beauty and uh, the roots of the, the concept of beauty because you have uh, given an outlook uh, to the, the history of aesthetics and so uh, talking about Shaftesbury or Baumgarten mm -hmm. and the, the founder of, uh, of aesthetics. My, my question is uh, what do you think about uh, beauty if it is uh, um, conditioned by culture and so we are uh, well, uh, repropose uh, uh, a Western concept of beauty, or do you think it is possible to have a sort of ontological idea of beauty, recalling Plato and the, the world of ideas? And so maybe we have a study that is uh, uh, transnational and maybe uh, transcultural about uh, the role of beauty. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've been talking about so far uh, about European butterflies. And of course, uh, this is something that we want to, um, I mean, bring to the fore. And we decided since the beginning of the project to focus only on European butterflies, because otherwise it would have been incredibly difficult to carry out this project. Uh, in a global perspective. And I know that because, uh, as I told you, I've been working a bit on these issues in empirical aesthetics. And there is a wonderful and interesting line of research in empirical aesthetics about cultural differences. Uh, and Mutlida in Vienna is working on that uh, with uh, uh, a couple of art historians of there in, in Vienna. And they are, for instance, working on the different aesthetic experience and aesthetic appreciations of the same work of art from people coming from, I don't know, a country in Europe, whatever you want, and people coming from China or Japan. 
with the eye tracker, for instance, there are wonderful differences about the way in which uh, people from different cultures, uh, from China or Japan, focus on different elements of the work of art uh, in comparison with people coming from, I don't know, Italy or Germany or Austria. There are cultural differences in the modulation of the visual perception. So I would say that uh, our decision since the beginning has been we focus only on European butterflies. We want to translate the website and the test in, into English in order to be able to spread this test uh, in many European countries. But uh, at the moment, uh, it would be incredibly difficult to uh, carry out such a work uh, on a global perspective because usually because actually the, the yeah, I, I really, I really think that culture as a role in the way in which we um, understand the beauty. Um, and I'm also aware that, um, of course, you start from beauty, beauty as a role and as a crucial role when you talk about aesthetics, but it's not the only aesthetic category. Uh, particularly now, particularly right now, particularly in our contemporary experience uh, that you have to take into account when you talk about aesthetics. So that's why I put in the title of this presentation, the role of beauty and other aesthetic categories in, conserva in biological conservation strategies, because it's not just that, it's not just that uh, it's um, uh, uh, this idea of um, I don't know the sublime, for instance, the 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 this idea of being marvelous, uh, or um, it's not just beauty. It's not just beauty, and um, uh, beauty is so difficult to be defined. It's so difficult to be um, understood. Uh, in um, uh, it has Quite been so ability. many. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. So um, uh, my point is, of course, when you when you work on interdisciplinary project, uh, at a certain point, you have to make your cho your choices. You have to reduce the, con the complexity because otherwise um, you cannot uh, implement the project. On the other hand, uh, uh, for me as a philosopher, is uh, really interesting. It's really, really important to try to um, have always in mind this fact of uh, the multifactoriality or the idea of an aesthetic experience which is multi component. Because otherwise, uh, um, I don't know, we choose a component and say, okay, this is beautiful because it's symmetrical, this is beautiful because uh, as a uh, lively. Uh, colors, but it's not like that. It's not just that. Just that is, uh, as I told you, perception, emotion, and cognition, and um, that's why I would say that uh, uh, for now we are satisfied with a European <laughs> perspective because otherwise uh, it could be incredibly difficult <laughs> to do this work um, um, uh, on a global perspective. But thank you, thank you so much for the question. You too. Thank you. If uh, if there are no other questions, uh, if I may, I would like just uh, to uh, yeah propose um, a very short uh, remark or comment. So it is connected uh, precisely with uh, with the role of beauty. It seems to me in your in your project, uh, it is really interesting the way in which uh, you um, puts in prominence, let's just say, the nature of beauty as uh, uh, a relational trait something like this i don't want to say nothing more precisely but the point is uh, beauty is not just uh, in the eyes of the observer it is, it is not just uh, connected with the, the subject let us say nor with the object but it is in the middle so in your project it seems to me really interesting to consider this relational trait as you as proposed that is another way to consider the relational trait not mine <laughs> yeah but the, the idea is a sort of a, a connection between beauty and the ecological approach and so this mm -hmm. is really interesting not just uh, um, in, in in light of uh, the connection between aesthetic and biology and uh, so for instance other kind of sciences but uh, of course, uh, in particular, for from a philosophical point of view, so in, uh, for the role of the investigations in aesthetics uh, concerning precisely the concept of beauty or the category of beauty, of course. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, David. Uh, 
really really thank you because this is the point for me because uh, um, to be honest when I started working with uh, Leonardo and the biologist the idea was uh, okay we want to identify this aesthetic bias all butterflies which have symmetrical uh, wings are beautiful so beauty is symmetry no, this is not the point, because if you agree with such a view, you agree with the view of an objectified idea of beauty, as if beauty isn't the object, I don't know, symmetry is beauty, or I don't know, contrast is beauty, or this is not the point, of course, for us, uh, and, and for the uh, tradition of uh, uh, philosophical aesthetics. So that's why I always stress the importance of taking into account all the components, the emotional component, the subject, what the subject knows, the cognitive component, the component of knowledge, and then the perceptual features. Because as you told me, really beautiful. We have lost you. Sorry, Maria. I can't hear you any longer. There is a... There was a, a lag on beauty. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Grazie, can you hear us? Yeah, just because th there was a, a very short... Uh, yeah, oh, a very okay. short detail stop of okay. the connection and then we, we, we lost yeah. it <laughs> okay okay i'm here i'm here okay uh, i was telling uh, i was saying that um i very much agree with what you um uh what you was telling us that that uh, the, this idea of relational of a relational trait because um at my point uh, uh that's my point uh, is not um, um an objective feature in, in the object but it's really in the middle between a subject and an object. And that's why I also stress the importance of taking into account what the subject knows, what the subject feels, and what the object has as its distinctive feature, features. That's it precisely in the middle between these different components. There, there is the aesthetic experience because of the ways it's a reductionist way of approaching aesthetics and uh, I don't want any <laughs> any reduction more, so to speak. Uh, so thank you. This is the point. Thank you. So uh, Francesco Camboni uh, has a question for you. Thank you, Maria Grazia. I indeed, it is just a kind of follow up on uh, your latest comments, but it's about this relational uh, component of beauty, which is quite a, a, lies at the core of, or, of your project. I was just wondering along your presentation, which I highly appreciated, whether a, a, so, a sort of a, um, early notion of empathy can play some role in understanding beauty so understood. Because uh, as far as I can tell, the earliest uh, uh, accounts and theorizations of empathy uh, attempted to frame it as a, an aesthetic, cat, aesthetic category, right? So I was thinking, for example, of uh, Robert Fisher uh, mm -hmm. and uh, Theodore Lips. Uh, and in, in Fisher, empathy is uh, the human capacity to um, feel a perceptual object uh, with uh, the observer's feelings. And I was wondering whether su such a, an aesthetic theorization of empathy can play some role in your project. Or otherwise, yeah. uh, empathy as a kind of concern toward a, a, a morally valuable object can play a role in, in this uh, 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 more value-laden um, way of framing empathy. But I was wondering why you do not, cons if you uh, do not consider it as uh, uh, salient for your authorization, why? Yeah, okay, okay. Because for me, empathy is more concerned that uh, um, uh, a valuable component for my project actually um i mean you um we know because of course this idea of the aesthetic preferences the human aesthetic preferences uh, this point has become a concern in conservation studies and there have been a bit of studies uh, over the last 10 years more or less uh, trying to understand why we are we feel more attracted towards for instance mammals uh, 
um, instead of, I don't know, insects. Of course, we are more attractive towards mammals uh, and not that much towards insects because uh, empathy has a role. So, for instance, uh, I don't know, because they are more similar to us. And so we feel empathic with, uh, I don't know, pandas or polar bears or, um, uh, I don't know, uh, neotenic uh, animals. So this idea of young animals or kitties or things like that with insects uh, is uh, very difficult to feel empathic because they are completely different uh, uh, from uh, any kind of experience we may have. Uh, they are very much different from any kind of uh, um, uh, uh, understanding of the world we may have. That's why I don't think that we uh, talking about insects, although I'm aware that butterflies within the class of insects are special because uh, all insects can be disgusting for us as humans, but not butterflies. And you know, psyche in Greek, the soul, the butterflies, there is uh, a mythology and symbolism about butterflies in ancient Greek and uh, more ancient cultures and so on and so on. So we know that butterflies are special within the class of insects. And we know that insects are not that much attractive because they are very different from us. So I would say that the empathy can play a role, but, uh, because, but I'm not so interested in the role of empathy. Also because empathy is the idea of, uh, I feel attached to an object because uh, I can recognize myself in a sense, into the object. And if you move from that relational understanding of the aesthetic experience that David was mentioning in his question, that it was also a point for me, I would say that uh, you have to preserve that sense of uh, being stranger or being diverse because it is important. It's also important with, with works of art and this is important with living beings. And for me, it's really positioning yourself in the middle. So empathy is, uh, I love you because you are a bit of myself. <laughs> I love you because I recognize myself in you. And I would say that beauty is, uh, I appreciate you because we um, meet midway between me and you, which is something different than being empathic, okay? <laughs> but thank you, thank you, thank you, Francesco, for, uh, for the question. Thanks for your answer. Yeah. I I really appreciate uh, your your point, uh, Maria Grazia, also because uh, there is this uh, clear idea of uh, um, mid-term approach, let us say. <laughs> so the, the, um, the, the the very interesting point is uh, to uh, open the investigation on the differences and on yeah. the mm, opportunity to meet differences. This is yeah. uh, another relevant point. Yeah, 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 totally agree, totally agree. And so n n not just to consider something that is formed in a certain way or something that is uh, uh, composed in a certain way, this is another problem that also today is uh, um, relevant in, uh, in, in, in the evolution of the artistic practices, but uh, this is another field. But at the same time, this is also a way to uh, emphasize how important it is for uh, philosophical investigations to recognize the role of a variability of mutations of uh, uh, something that is really challenging. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, very much agree, very much agree. Uh, I think that preserving that degree of diversity is really is really something that we have to care about because otherwise uh, we want to protect the world because we recognize ourselves in the world, which is not the point actually, because um, I mean, we are not one of the different forms of life in the world. And that cannot be the only way of finding uh, um, good reasons to protect biodiversity. The fact that we uh, find ourselves uh, um, represented or reproduced in any other kind of life on this planet. And I think that aesthetics has a role in these. Aesthetics has this wonderful idea of preserving the diversity of the work of art we experience and the preserving the 
unicity or uniqueness of ours as observer that particular work of art is it there is this idea of contingency in the aesthetic experience which i find wonderful and really useful also in approaching the natural world yeah yeah uh, as Kant uh, wrote, wrote in the Critique of the Power of Judgment, uh, the beauty is something that happens zufall, is that zufall, zufällig, contingent, really, really contingent in the sense of uh, there is something unexpected that happens, uh, something div diverse from what I was expecting, and that's beauty, actually, yeah. Uh, there is a comment, a very interesting comment from Matteo in the chat box, if you want uh... I can read it or uh, if you prefer. Yeah, you... Thank you. Yeah, please. I link to the previous question about the cultural aspect of beauty. I think as an, as an example, the recent shift that has occurred in the perception of human beauty through the representation of non-conforming bodies, queer and heterodeviant aesthetics driven by both art, fashion, film and photography, as well as feminist and queer movements. Perhaps, the same process could happen for animals querying their representation and the aesthetic appreciation of the multiplicity of their bodies and features, a queer process promoted both by artistic and institutional representation and by our own relation and intimacy with the otherness of animals. Instead mm -hmm. of, taking of taking beauty as a, a hierarchical category, we could act to expand empathy, aesthetic experience and appreciation. Yeah. This is something like a, a sort of suggestion that uh, offer yeah. a synthesis among uh, the different questions you received. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I agree. I agree. Uh, under the, so I mean, I, I have, uh, I, I would be cautious in using, as I told you, this notion of empathy, but I very much agree that the idea of is extending, ex expanding the our intimacy with the otherness of animals. Really, otherness is the key, is the key, is the key concept in this idea. So when I say, okay, using, uh, let's use beauty as a driving force, of course, this is the first step of my project. The second step is try to work on this remodulation of this aesthetic experience as a process. Uh, and at the end of this process, there is this idea of promoting really intimacy with the otherness of animals. Um, uh, so, um, uh, an aesthetic experience in which uh, I would say that at the end, in the end, an aesthetic experience in which the point is not how satisfied I feel with the shape that I'm experiencing, for instance, in the sense of beauty, but um, how uh, I feel and how can feel satisfied with the experience of the otherness of animals. So otherness is actually for me the key. But it's a gradual process, a step by step. So first of all, the first thing is quantifying this aesthetic bias and then try to focus on the aesthetic bias, understanding the different components of the bias or the aesthetic experience and its role. And then say also to take distance from the category of beauty as the only important category in aesthetics and try to develop this idea of uh, uh, promoting the intimacy as Matteo wrote with the otherness of animals because um, I think that aesthetics is much more than the experience of works of art, for instance, of course, because otherwise I would not speak about the study experience in butterflies, but aesthetic is also much more than the experience of beauty, much more than that. It's a starting point, but it's not the end point. It's not the um, end of the um, uh, aesthetic discourse, particularly today, of course, in the contemporary aesthetic experience, which is not so focused on beauty as we know all. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Matteo, for the comment. I think if uh, there are no other comments or questions, uh, we, we can stop here. Thank you once again, Maria Grazia, for your talk. Thank you uh, for and inviting for me. All the thank participants you. Uh, to the presentation. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me.